you couldn't see anything. The inside of the core of this hurricane was just a solid whiteout. It was just white. It was pure energy with like wreckage flying by. And there was a screaming sound that was so loud. I was with a couple of people, including a, a couple of women who were, who were holding their ears. Hurricane Melissa made landfall as one of the strongest storms to ever come ashore in the Atlantic. It had sustained winds at 185 miles per hour, a high-end Category 5 storm. And in the middle of this was videographer Josh Morgaman. He's been in some of the strongest storms on Earth. And Melissa, he said, ranks as one of the strongest. I had the privilege to talk with him about what it was like inside of this Category 5 storm and the ongoing recovery efforts in Jamaica. So I'm here with extreme storm chaser, Josh Morgaman. Josh, so much for taking uh, time to talk with me here about uh, Melissa and the impacts out there from this storm system. Um, Josh, you've been through over 80 plus eye walls. And this Category 5, how does this rank against all the other storms you've been through here? It's a good question. I'm still sort of like reflecting on it, sort of digesting it. There's some kind of like, yeah, there's some digesting after an experience like this, but it very well might have been number one uh, out of the 83 hurricanes I've been in, in terms of just the unbelievable ferocity of this thing. Definitely for sure. Top three, possibly number one. It was off the charts. This is as strong as hurricanes get. That is absolutely incredible. And, and I guess to follow up on that, so you were communicating, you're very good at putting out information in real time during and ahead of these storms. People all over the world watch you. And I know that on October 28th at 1025, you put out a tweet, and this is just a little clip of it, frightening power, whiteout, roofs tearing off, gusts like bombs. And then after you put out this tweet, you went communication dark for about 36 hours. And that was right when the storm was making landfall. Can you talk me through what happened during those 36 hours? Yeah, I think that tweet, I think I must have sent that just around when we were entering the eye wall. We started to get real wind damage. The building across the street, the, the roof ripped off. And then the second story, which was made of concrete, collapsed. That's how strong the winds were already. And it actually got worse from there. The palm trees were bending almost to the ground. It was just wild looking. And then everything just turned white. You couldn't see anything. The inside of the core of this hurricane was just a solid whiteout. It was just white. It was pure energy with like wreckage flying by. And there was a screaming sound that was so loud. I was with a couple of people, including a, a couple of women who were, who were holding their ears. That's how loud the scream of the wind was. We, we were in the kitchen of the hotel. We finally had to bolt the door shut. And when you peek through the cracks in the shutters, all you could see was whiteness. And I remember thinking to myself, this town's getting absolutely blasted. And when the, the hurricane started to move away, my fears were well-founded. The destruction was just off the charts. Hard to even capture it in words. But, I mean, as far as just saying it in words go, not too many people have been through Cat 5 storms. And I think that paints a very vivid description there, Josh. Um, and you're talking about the aftermath here, uh, impacts across Jamaica. I mean, you were there for days after the landfall. What do they need in Jamaica right now? What do you think is the best way for people back in the States to support them? That's a great question. So the, the, the whole island was not hit the same. The eastern part where the capital Kingston is got off pretty easy. They basically had a tropical storm on that side. The violent inner core of the hurricane struck the west end of the island, which is a little more rural, has some resorts and stuff. That area was flattened. Wood buildings, flattened. Concrete buildings, depends how good the concrete was. Some of them collapsed. Some of them stayed off, stayed up. Of the ones that stayed up, almost every building lost its roof. The, the the roads in the impact zone, it's just it's just piles of rubble, and the rubble's made of uh, buildings, houses, power poles, trees. It's just a big mess. So some of the first steps are trying to they're trying to plow paths through the wreckage because that's number one. You need to do that to get the relief in there. 
and then they're trying to get food and medical aid in. I have to say, I was impressed. I think that the, the Jamaicans have done a very good job with the initial steps. The city of Black River was absolutely devastated. I mean, devastated. And when I was there a couple of days after the hurricane, I sensed that things were, I don't want to say under control, but they had military and cops on every corner. They had aid trucks going through. Every resident had their arms full of uh, supplies. They had medical, uh, mobile clinic people on the ground. So I was like, okay, wow, this is a great first step. But any hurricane would need, any, I'm sorry, any nation would need help after a hurricane like this. Even after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of Americans don't know, we got international help, believe it or not, after Katrina. And a small country like Jamaica absolutely needs help in terms of resources and stuff. So folks should uh, help out. And the best way to do that is to go to supportjamaica.gov.jm. Let me make sure I have that right. Yeah. So supportjamaica.gov.jm. That's a good portal to get started to give help. All right, we'll make sure we have a link to all of that on our website just to make sure people can get there and get to the best resources. Now, last question I got for you, Josh, here. I know you are busy. You're going after Melissa. You're about to go chase another typhoon here on the other side of the world. Um, and that leads into the final question. A lot of people are going to ask this. Why do you do what you do? I mean, you go inside these storms. What What drives you to do this? Sometimes I ask myself that question, you know, deep into this chase, I remember just thinking, God, I just, I really hate this, just the uncertainty and the stress when you're in a, a country that you're not familiar with and it's the middle of the night and you're tired and the hurricane's coming in and you're trying to find somewhere to survive it and it's scary and it's unpleasant. And I ask myself that, but, you know, just that, that fascination um, that, that, that hurricanes bring, you know, just, it, they're so hypnotic to me that I just, it's almost like a drug that I can't help but chase despite how unpleasant it is sometimes. It's, um, it is sort of an addiction to be perfectly honest. Wow. Well, Josh, thank you so much for talking with me. I truly appreciate it. I know you are busy, you're between storms. So thanks for taking the time to, to get that information out there to make sure, you know, this recovery efforts from Melissa, I'm sure are going to take a long, long time. So more information, the better. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rob.